Good afternoon and welcome to our general surgery lecture series. I am Dr. Gala Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. We come to you today from Merida, Mexico. Special greetings to our friends from uh, University of Anahuac and all our colleagues from the Yucatan Peninsula. Thank you so much for joining us. I would like to extend also warm greetings to our friends across Latin America and the Caribbean and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located in the bottom of your screen. Our moderator today will be our very own Dr. Rogelio Rivas, who is our Corporate Vice President of Baptist Health International. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Rupa Sitaramaya. Her presentation is titled Robotics in General and Bariatric Surgery. Dr. Sita Ramaya is a board certified general and bariatric surgeon at Baptist Health South Florida. She specializes in weight loss surgery with extensive training in robotic and laparoscopic surgery for minimally invasive and bariatric procedures, including the Da Vinci and the spider surgical systems. Dr. Sita Ramaya received her medical degree from Missouri Medical College in in Karnataka, India. She completed her internship in the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio and residency in general surgery at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Subsequently, she completed the fellowship in pediatric and endoscopic surgery at the University of Tennessee Medical Science Center, followed by another fellowship in minimally invasive bariatric and metabolic surgery at Baptist Health South Florida. Dr. Sitara Maya has published articles on bariatric surgery in scientific journals and presented her research at medical conferences nationally and internationally. She's a member of the American Board of Surgeons, American College of Surgeons, the Society of American Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons, and the American Medical Association, Florida State Medical Association, and of course, the James D. Hardy Society. Recently, she accepted the appointment of assistant professor of surgery at Florida International University, Herbert Werdan College of Medicine. Please let's give all a warm welcome to Dr. Rupa Sitaramaya. Dr. Sitaramaya, what a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. The floor is yours, Doctor, if you want to share your presentation. Thank you. Will do. Thank you for the kind introduction and, and having me here for the webinar. Uh, welcome to all. Um, so I'll be talking about robotics in general and bariatric surgery. I will be touching base on what is robotics, uh, what, do, uh, what are the advantages, uh, what kind of systems are approved by the FDA, um, and where do I use it, and what's coming in robotics. So we'll also touch on some of the uh, journals, papers, uh, that are published currently, and that would help us with deciding on the cost as well. Um, so here are, here are my disclosures. And I am a consultant for Arthrex Inc. and Intuitive Inc., which uh, kind of has Da Vinci under them. Uh, so what is a robotic surgery? Robotic surgery is an advanced form of minimally invasive surgery. Like what comes under it is also laparoscopic surgery. It is an advanced form where a surgeon uses computer controlled robot to assist them in certain surgical procedures. So there are many, very many procedures that we use them in today. Um, so the surgical robots are self-powered computer controlled devices that can be programmed to aid in position and manipulation of the surgical instrument. So it does help you to move your instrument, position them precisely and, and do the surgery. So this does provide surgeon with a better accuracy, flexibility and control. Um, there are three types of the robotic uh, systems available. One is supervisory control system. This is where you put in a program, the whole robot, to do the surgery, so that's a supervisory control system. The telesurgical system, which is kind of what we use currently, um, where you 
kind of take over the uh, robot and all your movements are kind of manipulated and, and kind of done at the bedside. Uh, this is a current we use with the Da Vinci. There is a shared control system, which is kind of built in safety with it. Like how we have now cars, if you're gonna get into the crash, they kind of put the pedal, you know, brake on it. It's a similar system. So the surgeon and the, and the system, the, the computer have the shared uh, control. So that way there is anything that's gonna happen that the computer thinks it's gonna be uh, unsafe, it'll stop you from doing that. So that's a shared control system. So majority of the robots now are telesurgical systems. So how did this robotic surgery come across? So the first thing is the world robot was introduced in 1921 by a Zach uh, playwright, uh, Karel Kapik, uh, in his play called Rossum's uh, Universal Robots. That was the first word that was like robot was brought in. Um, so as we all know that minimally invasive surgery began with laparoscopic cholecystectomy, right, in 1985. So the first surgical robot was actually an arthrobot. So this was developed and used both in 1984 in Vancouver, B, uh, British Columbia. So what they used it for was to, it was a voice controlled positioning system for the leg for the patients. So that's where the first robotic uh, uh, surgery started. And in 85, as you can see here, the Puma 560, this actually used for the brain biopsy. So they integrated another thing. Look at this, CT guidance to do the brain biopsy. So this was an integration to kind of use the image guided to do the robotic bi brain biopsy. So the next one that came was a probiotic. This was in London, Imperial College, London. This was for the prostate surgery. This is like kind of evolution happening as we can see that where we use it today is also depends on all this evolution that's happening. These are all proto kind of types that were used in different places. So the next one was also an ortho, uh, orthopedic robot, which was called a Robodoc. Uh, this was from an integrated surgical system that came in 1992 for hip replacement. So they would measure it, they would assess it, and it would help them with the, with the kind of hip replacement. So the actual first robotic surgery happened in May, 2006, it was in Italy. Uh, this was actually for a um, atrial fibrillation. It was very successful. This was a 40 minute surgery. Um, so there are some FDA approved robots that came into, uh, came into us after all these robotic uh, you know, prototypes. So in 1990, this was the first one that was approved. It's called the ESOP system. Um, this was approved for an endoscopic surgical procedure, which is a, a laparoscopic surgical procedures, right? So this was a voice activated uh, robot that used to hold the endoscope. When I was a medical student, hold the endoscope yourself, medical students, but this was a voice activated robot used for uh, holding the endoscope. Um, and uh, this actually was developed by NASA. So the reason they developed it was because to kind of help them um, service the uh, you know, space uh, station uh, uh, unmanned uh, with, the, with the robotic arm. That's why they kind of developed this one. But it kind of came into the medical field with a voice activated um, holder for the endoscope. So in 2001, FDA cleared what's called Zeus. This is this was from computer motions, uh, motion. Uh, this was a three robotic arms that were kind of mounted on the operating table. So this one had a very very successful surgical uh, uh, surgeries in 1998. They actually were able to uh, reattach the fallopian tubes, uh, and all uh, there was a cardiac surgery that was performed with the Zeus. Uh, beating heart cabbage was done uh, by Zeus in 1998. Actual first robot that was approved was the Da Vinci system. As you can see, it was in 2000. This was the first robotic system that was approved for general laparoscopic surgery. This was also used successfully in 1998 for, um, you know, cardiac uh, uh, surgery. To start with in, in Germany, 
and then FDA approved it in 2000 uh, for general laparoscopic surgery. This is a, one of the widely used system. Uh, um, in our Baptist system, we have uh, the third generation of Da Vinci. Um, they started with S, SI, X, uh, XI, and then there was an X2, which is kind of in between the SI and the X. So we have currently the latest and greatest XI system in our uh, uh, healthcare uh, system here. Um, so the latest approval was in 2017. I saw this system when I attended a conference, a SAGES conference a couple of years ago. This is called the Senhan system or Transcentric Surgical Inc. produced it. Um, this is also approved for colorectal and gynecological surgery. As you can see, it is a individual arms and different uh, platforms there. Um, it does have the computer control on the side. So, so this is the latest one. So how does this robotic work? All these things look good, but how does it work? So what it has is, I'll talk about more about this Da Vinci because that's what I use. So, and this is the one that is used widely in the United States and outside the United States too, uh, for my uh, general and bariatric uh, surgical practice. So it has a patient side card and also a surgeon console, as you can see here. So the patient side card has all the robotic arms and that would hold the instruments. So the surgeon console has a computer that would where you control, where it kind of transmits your movement into the patient uh, control card. The surgeon works from the computer console in the operating room. It's usually sitting in the operating room in a corner and you visualize the whole operating field through the uh, eyepiece which has a 3D vision because there are two cameras in that, you know, uh, in the in the patient side card, which gives you depth perception. That's why it's a 3D camera attached to the robotic arm. And so at the bedside, you do have a scrub nurse who would hand you the instruments and a an assistant who would change your instruments at the patient card. And the, obviously the anesthesia controlling the whole other uh, anesthesia card. So the surgeon's hand hand movement, wrist movements, and finger movements. All of those are transmitted through the console to the patient side uh, you know, card. So it kind of, whatever movement I make is what is transmitted to the patient card. That's why it's a telesurgical system. It's all, it's mostly everything is done by the surgeon, not by the computer. It's you doing it. So, you know, so the robotic arms, move when you move. If you don't move, it doesn't move. So if I take off my face from the vision visual, vision port, it stops moving. And if I don't move my hand, it doesn't move. So the surgical team at the bedside does supervise it. They help me with instrument changes and all the stuff. There is really safety built into the system because as you can see, when I put the port, I usually go to the bedside I put my all my place, my ports, like how you do it for laparoscopy. And then we connect all the arms and we put the instrument and then I go to the console. My assistant changes at the console. They change the instruments. It kind of parks in the same place. So once a belly is insufflated and I have put the instrument and they park in this place, when I take it out and put it back, it comes back to the same place. So. There is safety built into it. So that's why it's not gonna go hit something or damage anything. The second thing is if there is a power outage, say for example, the, build, the, the whole system gives you five minutes, five minutes to get the instruments out, the robot off the patient, and then you can do it either laparoscopically or, or robotically, but I mean, uh, laparoscopically are open. So, so there are different safety systems built into the, the, the robot. So that way it stays safe. Um, if there is any error, it gives you, it shows you what's going on and, and you can, there are recoverable errors that you can, you can kind of tell the um, system to recuperate from that. Um, I've used this uh, for many years now, um, almost since my fellowship, like 12, 13 years. And uh, very rarely we have had any issues with it. Um, so what are the advantages, real advantages of using the robot in surgery? The major advantage is great visualization. 
As I said, those cameras are very good. 3D vision, high resolution, clarity is so good. I usually have my students or residents or fellows, whoever is there, take a look and, and, and it's, it's, everybody comes out saying, wow, you can see all that stuff. Yes, you can see very minute things, very precise things. It has a digital zoom. The other thing as a surgeon, I love it, is I can control the camera. You know, the camera can be, it moves with my cue. Like, you know, I move it with my hand, you know, fingers and the leg and stuff like that. And I can, you know, tilt it the way I want it. I can go zoom in and see what I want to. So it's very, very, very precise. And the second thing is enhanced dexterity. So the robotic hands have high degree of dexterity. So this allows the surgeon to work in very uh, narrow spaces. That's why it's mostly has taken off in the world of GYN, U procedures and stuff, because imagine the pelvis is so small and you can operate in that small area with so much precision that it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So, so it does help uh, in those tight spaces. I like for my cases when I have to do hiatal hernias, paraesophageals, um, any upper, uh, you know, uh, stomach uh, stuff. Um, it does help with the motion scaling, um, so the tremor reduction. So there is no jerkiness involved in this instrument. It does. It just moves very smoothly and does all those. You know, it kind of reduces those tremors that usually some people have. It has endo-wristed instrument. So endo-wristed means it can move in different directions, right? So because laparoscopic instrument, I am a laparoscopic trained surgeon, I can do laparoscopically too, but it's once you start using the Da Vinci, you will understand. It has endo instruments. When I have to suture it, it does this instead of this, like how I do with the laparoscopy. So it's very useful in suturing, like when I do hernias and stuff, I suture every one of the meshes up to the abdominal wall. So it helps with those things. The other um, advantages, great precision, as I told you, you can see, you can visualize, you can do it precisely your surgery, Foul, fast and foolproof setting. Nowadays, the ones that we have, the third generation, if you kind of set it up and say, you want to do surgery in the pelvis, the robotic arms and everything moves to assist you with doing the, your surgery in the pelvis. And also in the camera, there is a built-in thing called target. You can target, like I did yesterday, a sigmoid colon. I just put my camera, pointed towards the sigmoid colon, held the button, the whole arms, all the other arms move to kind of, you know, direct you to that, that area. So, so it's a fast foolproof setting and, and there are a lot of built-in system that will help you or assistants who would, who would bring this robot to the bedside uh, in, in setting it up. Rapid instrument exchange. I told you it's very easy to go in and out. It, it has its own memory in it. So it will take you to the same place that you took the instrument out from. Multi-quadrant access is the greatest thing that has come with the XI. You can do, say for example, you want to do a, a lymph node biopsy in the pelvis. At the same time, after that, you want to turn around and, and do something else in the upper abdomen, you can go ahead and do it. I have done cases with the GYN or a GU surgeons. And they have done a, a ovarian cystectomy. At the same time, I have done cholecystectomy right after that. So it's a multi quadrant access. So interactive video display, those who are in the teaching um, uh, institutions or fellowships, this one is a great one because a, a screen mark it. You can mark, hey, cut here or do this or dissect here. Let me see this. So if you mark it on there, the surgeon who's sitting at the console can see it inside. Oh, this is what my you know, mentor is asking me to do. So they can do it. And also dual console. You can have two consoles in the same room connected to the same robot and working together. So the way that I have used it is in fellowship. Like, you know, your attending is on one and the fellow is on another one. You both can share the, the uh, control. Um, if it's when it becomes complicated, maybe the attending can do a little bit and you can do a little bit later once it becomes a little easier for you. Or two different surgical services can do 
that was surgery at the same time, like tumors or something that is spread to ureter or a colon, and both services can be sitting there and doing surgeries, uh, you know, taking over the control when you need it. And it does have superior ergonomic. When it comes to bariatric, we all know it. We all feel it on our shoulder and everything. So it does give you that advantage of like superior ergonomics. You're sitting there doing it. And this is the one that takes the most hit for me because as a laparoscopic surgeon, your hand is always and the shoulders are up. So this one helps you tremendously. So other benefits, what are the benefits of the surgery itself? Like doing all this is for beneficial for us, for the patients and stuff. What is the benefit for the patient? Uh, how does it help? So it does, very many studies have been done. Now, if you look at it, there is papers from GU, GYN, general surgery, bariatric, everything. So this is a gist of what I've taken from all of those papers. It has shown that there's shorter hospitalization because these people get better faster, they go out. Um, because you, as you can see, there is reduced pain and discomfort. You're doing it with a smaller incision. So low risk of your infection, faster recovery time. So they return to normal activities faster. Um, minimal scarring, definitely. I mean, come on. It's very important to have like, you know, some component of, uh, um, you know, cosmesis too. You should always respect what patients want. And it is minimal scarring. Inside too, minimal adhesions, right? We all know adhesions cause small bowel obstructions later. So there is minimal scarring on the skin itself, minimal scarring inside too. And very, very many studies have shown that there is, it reduces blood, uh, you know, blood loss and transfusion rates. So it's been shown in every one of the services, every one of the papers that there is a less uh, transfusion required. So who uses it? As we have talked about before, urologic surgery, definitely. Nowadays, people think that if you didn't do robotic prostatectomy, that's not a standard of care. That's how it has become, right? General surgeons have caught on to it. We do hernias, we do colons, we do everything. Thoracic surgeons use it. Cardiac surgeons use it. You, As you can see, prototypes came up with the cardiac surgery too, right? The first, uh, the 2006, uh, the surgery that was done in Italy, unmanned one was cardiac surgery. So endocrine surgery, Gynecological surgery is the one who has taken over this thing. They are the fastest growing robotic surgery uh, service uh, everywhere. And neurosurgery has taken over too. So there is a new latest neuro arm that is introduced. It's MRI compatible. So what they're like trying to look at is um, this MRI compatible uh, arm. You can only imagine if you integrate your MRI image in it, you can do precisely biopsies and that. orthopedic surgery is using it, pediatric surgery, even though we say they're very small, they have come up with the, the, this uh, usage in the pediatric uh, world too. So, so all these services are currently using uh, robot. So going into some of the papers um, to look at where these robots made a difference or didn't, is it better, is it worse, what is it? So I kind of looked at some of the general surgery papers, some bariatric, um, and also we'll talk about some of the cost uh, effectiveness too. So this is a meta-analysis um, that was published in 2014. So robotic adaptation, uh, adaption in abdominal surgeries has been slow. Do you know why? Because most of these general surgeons are laparoscopic trained. Um, they are highly skilled. Obviously, they, are, they, they have a very advanced laparoscopic skill sets they possess. Um, so they didn't think, you know, uh, taking another thing and doing it the same way. But once they started to realize it, now it's kind of, you know, becoming uh, uh, more and more used in general surgery. But at that moment, that's what the thing was. It was slow compared to like GU or a GYN and other people. And all the, in this paper, it showed that there is low mortality in patients who underwent robotics compared to laparoscopic and open. It did have shorter hospital stay. They were used in big surgeries like gastrectomy. This, this paper included robot, robotics in gastrectomy, one like gastric bypass, anti-reflux surgery. They're not small surgeries, prostatectomy, colorectal procedures, 
uh, were all included in this meta-analysis. So it did show, we all know that, longer operating time because it takes time to set it up, time to, you know, we, we they were learning too. These are all initial papers, right? So longer operative time, less transfusion, as I said, a lot of, lot of papers have shown that. Lower conversion to open. This is where the robotic is very useful. This is what the thing is. We should be, we kind of, the way I look at it is like, this is useful in a patient that would have, we would have done open procedure, you know? So you're using minimally invasive surgery, which would give you an advantage about like less pain, shorter hospital stay in a patient that would have been open and stayed longer. Because hospital stay, hospital cost adds up with a longer stay. It did have a higher hospital stay at that moment because robot itself costs a lot of money. I think the company has also learned how to kind of, I don't know whether to call it rented or whatever they're doing nowadays. So it kind of, they're trying to get the cost down for the hospital. Shorter hospital stay, um, as I said. And look at this, adequate oncologic accuracy, meaning they had good margins and oncologic resections were complete. Um, in these robotic uh, patients. So, so it gives you more advantage about like vision, accuracy, precision, uh, ergonomics, um, uh, you know, compared to uh, other uh, 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 laparoscopic or open procedures. So coming to bariatric surgery itself in 2015, um, the study showed this was used in very complex technologically uh, demanding surgical situations. It showed there was lower leak rate in Roux-en-Y gastric bypass compared to laparoscopic method, all right? And also shorter learning curve. So in this study, they included the learning curve because as you can see, most of these bariatric surgeons are advanced laparoscopists, right? So these people have trained and they've gotten to uh, advanced laparoscopy. So they looked at what is a learning curve for, for person, say for example, a fellow who would do um, the laparoscopic compared to the robotic, there was a shorter learning curve for robotics. Um, there was lower complication rate in one of the studies. And there, they also um, said that there was a specific advantage in some situations like revisions and stuff. It overcame some of the laparoscopic limitations. We know there is limitation from the laparoscopy, we'll talk about it, but it did overcome all that limitation. Improved ergonomics and operative operator fatigue. I can vouch for this. The reason is when we do bariatric surgery, the BMI varies from anywhere minimum of 35 in US to I have done 75. So you can only imagine BMI for 75 doing laparoscopically. It would two days I would be hurting, you know. So it is, it does improve ergonomic. It cuts down the operator fatigue. Um, I believe we'll be lasting longer if we kind of, you know, kind of use this because my shoulder and my arm, my, you know, I will, I'm able to use it longer, but still be able to do many surgeries uh, per day. So talking about robotics without talking about um, uh, money is not going to work, right? Because you want to know, it does cost a lot of money. Robot is not cheap. But there was a, a you know, CAT uh, technology report that came in 2011, September. They included four procedures, prostatectomy, hysterectomy, nephrectomy, and cardiac surgeries. So they did, it, uh, it did show operating room and time and cost was higher because, you know, operating room kind of, you know, it's like on a meter, it goes, you know, the money. So, but they didn't include any effect of learning curve because they didn't say whether they were new surgeons, or, you know, the people who are doing it and stuff like that. It did show that there was a length of stay was shorter, less blood loss, decreased transfusion requirements. So every one of these studies have shown that there is a length of stay goes down. Nowadays with reimbursements and stuff, this is very important for us, you know, because longer the length of stay, we actually lose money. So if you have a shorter length of stay, you actually make money on the patients. So coming to the general surgery world, um, 
This was a cost assessment uh, that was uh, done in 2017. There were uh, 31 studies that were included uh, with wide range of uh, surgical operations, very wide, everything was included. So if you can see it, there's a duration of surgical surgery, robotic open and laparoscopic in that order. So if you compare it, you can see that, that robotic is kind of equivalent to the open surgery, right? So because, um, because it's, it, these are the patients that would have gotten the, the open surgeries, the robotic surgery that you're doing are the patients that we would have converted into open from a laparoscopic. So, so these are the patients that have an advantage. And also the, these, these times are coming down, to be honest, I'm telling you this 2017, now with the excise system and, you know, because we have learned how to use it, how to dock it, how to kind of start the surgery. Most of the surgeries for us, we start in like five minutes. Five to 10 minutes is what we are looking at. I put my ports, I position my ports, we bring the robot, dock it, and start the case. Even if they have intra-abdominal lesions, I usually take it down with the robot. So it's like, you don't need to waste any time. You can just start your surgery right away. And also reveals, the, the robotic surgery under specific condition has been cost effective. Definitely, you will see it. it the advantage is in the revisional surgeries, high skill, skills needed surgeries, and those kind of things. So, how do you mitigate this cost? They also recommended these things. If you start doing large number of cases, presence of the intervention, we know that this is now only Da Vinci. There, there may be some other companies that are going to come out and we'll have more. There they are, you know, there are people who are trying to build some of the robots. Multidisciplinary team utilization, like meaning if your GU surgeon uses it and, and you are like, um, you know, you are a general surgeon, you use it and a GYN surgeon uses it, then that's gonna mitigate the cost because your utilization goes up. And also it may make it more reasonable because if you do all this stuff, and, 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 and make it cost effective. So, so where do I use it? Taking all this stuff, listening to all this stuff, where do, where do I see an advantage of this using this robot? In my general surgery practice, I do both general surgery and bariatrics. So I use it in anti-reflux um, surgeries. As I said, where you have a, a, a narrow, narrow place, that's where the utility is. So anti-reflux procedures like nissens or even paraesophageal hernias, hiatal hernia repairs, awesome. You can, your visualization is so good. You'll be able to get the stomach down and do beautiful surgery, put the mesh, suture it up. See that I was very afraid to put the tackers in there to close to the heart. So, but now with the suture, it's very easy to put in there. And hernia repairs, obviously I do hernia, bilateral inguinal hernias, completely robotic and Pain is not an issue because we just kind of use the mesh, um, you know, sutures in a couple of places or some of them are self-fixating ones. Um, patients go home the same day. Um, I have done it in patients who are really old. Uh, urinary retention hasn't been a problem. Uh, those are the issues, right? They, we keep them because of those things. They do very well. Ventral hernias, especially if medium-sized hernias, I even close the fascia. So you're doing comparable to open surgery. Like laparoscopically, it's very hard to close the fascia, but with robotically, it's easy. Like you take the sutures and you bring it together. Patients do well. So you're kind of closing the fascia and then put the mesh on top of it. And the mesh also, I fixate it with the suture. No tackers, nothing, you know. So they do really well. Most of the pain with the ventral hernias come with the transfascial sutures. So we are avoiding that. And so the pain uh, is very manageable in this patient. Um, obviously gastric procedures in bariatric surgery, sleeve and bypass and revisional surgeries. Ours is a, one of the programs that does completely robotic bariatric procedures. So people do come and visit us. You know, we do have privileges. That's the reason for my, you know, uh, consultancy with the uh, intuitive because we do take people who want to come visit, watch us do these surgeries. Uh, you're most welcome to come uh, and uh, you can get in touch with our international office. They will be able to help you. 
Um, so we use, we, we do completely robotic bariatric surgery. I just put the scope to go inside and then put all my, uh, you know, ports and dock it and do completely robotic. Um, revisional surgeries, uh, we do convert them from bands to bypass or sleeve. You know, those cases, you also know that it's very difficult because of the adhesion scarring from previous surgeries. With the robot, your visualization is so great. You'll be able to take down very safely. You've done very many revisional surgeries and people have done well. They go home the next day. We kind of, you know, so initially we used to get scared because you know revisional surgeries, you want to keep and watch them and stuff. With robot, they've done well. So as I said, it does get uh, cut your uh, hospital length of stay. And combined procedure with other services, as I mentioned before, GYN service or GU service, anybody else, they call us, we go, we kind of help them out, do it. And if there is adhesions in the pelvis, I go help them out, take the adhesions down, they complete their GYN uh, surgery. So it's been um, a, a great thing that we can do combined together all these and, and help our patients. So what are the real advantages of this robotic surgery? It, it extends benefits to MIS procedures that were not previously done. Imagine these things, the esophag total esophagectomies, coronary artery bypass graft. We never thought we wouldn't be cracking the chest and doing this, did we do them? Now radical prostatectomies. People used to have open prostatectomies, develop hernias, et cetera, et cetera. Nowadays, all these things have been possible because of the robotic surgery. It did increase surgeons who offer MIS surgery. Obviously, there's a shorter learning curve and it kind of, you know, you can see, I can see the progression in people who are great open surgeons who used to do open surgeries. They, they catch on to it and they are able to get on the uh, robotic bandwagon very easily. You know, that's how. GYN sur surgeries, many are doing robotic. So many people who never offered the MIS procedures before, they're offering MIS procedures today. It did come overcome some of the laparoscopic uh, difficulties, as I mentioned, loss of depth, perception, and, and, and also like natural high, uh, eye and, uh, hand and eye coordination, um, uh, intuitive movements, and then dexterity. As I said, it has high dexterity. That's why you're able to work in the small place. Um, and also cost, marketing, and politics can all affect the adoption of this new technology, but it's not going to stop technology that's truly enabling. It's truly enabling, as I mentioned before, because as you may see, laparoscopy also had the same, right? Longer to do surgeries before laparoscopic cholecystectomy had many common bulk injuries before. It's all about learning. It's all about understanding how safe we can be. How, how can we make it safe for our patients? Today, if you get an open surgery, that means your cobbler was really bad. Really, really, really bad. Because we still do really bad cases on the laparoscopy surgeries. So it is going to take over. It's going to, it's going to um, progress. It's, as I mentioned to my students, you know, it's a tool that we can all have it. We can use it. And it has its utility in, in places that, that are like very highly uh, complicated surgeries and revisional surgeries and stuff. So it has a digital interface to interact with the patient and does enhance performance of the surgery. There is tele uh, surgery that you can do if you, it's coming, you may be able to kind of contact your mentor and ask, hey, can you look up and see this? It's like a FaceTime. It's coming, it's coming. So you can kind of, you know, uh, at the same time, you can get a, 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 a counter or, or a advice from your mentor to do how to do these surgeries. Or if you get stuck with these things, you can get them to help you. There are new technologies coming with the robotics, like fluorescence. Fluorescence is where you inject the dye and the camera with the robot has a fluorescence camera. So you will be able to see the dye. So where do I use it? I've used it in a biliary tract. You can give it to them. You can see the biliary anatomy beautifully. I'm not saying it's gonna replace the col cholangiogram, no. This is to kind of see if you have a difficult case, if you have a difficult anatomy and you wanna see where the ducts are, you can use it. And it does show it very beautifully. And the integration of the, and, and, and the other place I use it 
is when I do call uh, the anastomosis or I want to check a blood supply. You give it to them, you do it. Even you remember in the past we used to use the woods lamp and all of this uh, similar kind of uh, thing. So and the fluorescence technology is also improving. Just so you know, there are people that are coming up with a fluorescence dye that can show you ureter. Can you imagine that? You don't have to wait for anybody to come and put those tents and all the other stuff. You give a dye and you will be able to see the ureter. So the fluorescence technology is coming. It's advancing very fast. Um, integration of the images. Can you imagine ima putting the CT of a, a liver tumor on the patient and then you're able to precisely tell where the tumor is. So that integration is also happening. Virtual and augmented reality. I kind of tried that in one of the conferences wearing uh, goggles and kind of, you know, it's it's cool, but you know, it's gonna have its own utility. We are kind of, you know, working on it. Telesurgery, as I said, single site platform is here. I have used it for means just doing through the belly button. Um, cosmetic wise, you can't even tell the patient had a cholecystectomy. Um, and they're trying to kind of get it to other places some limitations at this time because of their stapler and stuff. Otherwise, I would do uh, a, a right hemicolectomy with it. So, but staplers and stuff, they're coming up with it. Um, so single site platform is here, but it needs to kind of, you know, advance a little bit more. Natural lot of surgery, haptic feedback. They're working on it in the, uh, in some of the research uh, places. Um, this is going to empower the surgeon with more tools. Um, so robotic surgery is here to stay. Robotic surgery is a tool. Um, it has, um, you know, it's uh, advanced um, in taking care of patients and safely doing the surgery for very uh, complicated, complex surgical uh, procedures. Um, and uh, we use it in our system. As I said, if any of you are interested, you can come visit us and uh, we'll be happy to have you over uh, to look at our procedures and, and, uh, and, and get you going. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, kind of type in, I believe, and, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, Dr. Sidharmaya. That was a, a great uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure the group is going to have some questions for you. And, and I was just watching how everything has changed from the 2000 uh, to now and how many different generations of robots and how many specialists have jumped in. And the one part, because I know there's various insurance companies that have joined on this, uh, on this uh, webcast is seminar is, uh, they don't understand that we don't charge a penny more than laparoscopic surgery, right? It's the same right. charge, uh, except there, there might be a small component for a modifier that the doctor says Correct. using a robot. Uh, but basically, there is no change in cost, which is different than in most countries uh, that might charge a little extra for using the newer technology. Correct? Absolutely, that's right. We don't use, we don't charge them. Uh, there is a, just a modifier that's a dummy modifier. To be honest, it doesn't charge patient. Uh, it is just to keep up uh, our track, uh, track ourselves um, to kind of say how many robotic cases I've done. And, and it's also for credentialing that we use it because we want to know how many robotic cases you have done and you keep your skills sharp. Uh, there is another thing. The Intuitive itself has a app uh, that tracks you and it tells you how long you took your, you know, sleep gastrectomy that I did this morning. It'll tell me how many minutes I took and whether I was better than last time. And, you know, those kind of things. So, so the, so it's kind of a nice way to track yourself and, and keep your skills sharp. Um, the other uh, thing is like, you know, the modifier that we use sometimes is, is to show that they were, they were uh, very difficult cases. Um, that's the only modifier we use at this time for the robotics. We don't use upcharge them or charge them at all for the patients. Well, I'm going to go through two questions. The first one is, do you ever see a robotic surgery with some kind of use in brain tumors or something in certain areas such as inoperable regions? Yes, they are using it. As I said, there is an MRI. They're, they're doing it biopsy-wise and stuff. And, uh, you know, they're trying to get an MRI as I presented MRI arm. So to precisely integrate that MRI image and you can even be doing MRI and then 
doing the biopsy at the same time. So they are coming up with those things for the for the brain tumor. So at least we start with the biopsy and then uh, probably into kind of resections uh, later. Thank you, doctor. And next question is uh, from uh, Sus Pichardo. Uh, thank you for your insight. How different is the resistance feedback compared with the laparoscopic take? Correct. So uh, it, it, that was one of the concerns, right? I, I trained as a general surgeon and a laparoscopic, uh, you know, surgeon, and then came out, and then. Um, it's a it's a feedback uh, is what you're kind of asking. I got it. So haptic feedback. But what happens is laparoscopically too that you can't feel, right? But I'll tell you, as a laparoscopic surgeon, I can tell you whether the tissue is hard, tissue is soft. Tissue, you know, even though it's my hand is outside and I'm I'm touching it, I can feel it. So similarly with robotics, what happens is your visual cue becomes the greatest thing. When you touch the tissue and then it blanches, you know how hard you're holding it and how, how, how much pressure you should be putting it. It hasn't been an issue. People have done really well. I think our brain can process more than what we, can th what we think. I'll tell you that for sure. Because in the past, we always said we had to feel it. We had to feel with our finger and stuff. Not anymore. I feel it with my laparoscope. I feel it with my robotic arms. I'll tell you that that, that, that skill develops. You know, so so that's what has happened to it, and that's how you are going to develop too. You know, we know that there is nothing perfect in life, right? There is no perfection, as much as we want to be. But uh, Dr. Hakim, our colleagues, uh, always are dealing with certain complications, right? Uh, coming from other places, okay. uh, patients having leaks, patients with perforations. Uh, obviously, there's no substitute for training. Uh, but uh, I would say, what's what's the common thing for you that you see whenever there's a complication? What is there a common denominator, or is it kind of like all over the place? Uh, with, with regards to people coming from outside, I mean, with regards to our bariatric people itself, it's mostly like leaks and stuff. Um, you know, um, yeah. Most of these leaks, initial leaks, um, we kind of attribute to the technical part, um, like the staple, staples we use and stuff like that. Um, we do take care of them when they come in here. We have, as you guys have been supporting and we have all this greatest technology here, we've been able to help them. And, and also we have radiology colleagues and GI colleagues who are being on us, uh, with us uh, to take care of the complicated patients. So most of these initial initial um, leaks have been probably related to tech, uh, technique itself, um, and later ones are patient related. You know, they are smokers or they say pick and sets and stuff. That's what has been the problem uh, for them. And sometimes they even come with infections, which we don't see those much in here, but they do have infections. And as we know, infection rates are higher. Um, outside compared to the United States. So, so we do see them. And you, you touched on a point that's very important. Uh, back in the day when I trained, the single doctor was the supreme ruler and did everything they wanted with the case. The importance of how now you all work like a team, right? Even though you're the surgeon, uh, you have uh, this, this amazing team of, of radiologists that support you and IBR if you need it. Can you go into a little bit about how that has changed in training? It has changed very much. I'll tell you that for sure. My goodness, they are, as we have advanced with all these robotics, all this technology, integration of the fluorescein dye and, and single incision platforms and stuff, they've also advanced. Their endoscopic skills have gone up and they're able to do very many things uh, endoscopically. Um, in the past, in the leaks were like a dreaded complication in the sleeve, right? So people had to like go to ORs or, or probably got a stent and stuff. I have a colleague of mine who's a gastroenterologist who helped me with one of them. He just put some pigtail catheter through there and the patient got better. And we don't have complication with the stents and all the other stuff. And if there is any patient who has any kind of a abscess formation or or a leak with the fluid collection. 
Our IVR colleagues have been great. They are able to percutaneously drain it. So we are avoiding doing re-operations in very complicated patients and causing more complication than good. So this is, has been a multidisciplinary approach. We look at each patient and we kind of decide with them what can be done and how we can best serve these patients. So, so it's been great. I really love it when I work with all of them and they come up with the ideas and, and, and it, it, it generates ideas, you know, like, you know, it gives you so much power in taking care of the patient. I think Dr. Dr. Hakeem, my yeah. colleague has a question. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me well, but uh, I, with the advent of the new technology, uh, Dr. Uh, it, it, obviously the, the procedure has changed uh, dramatically over the years. And um, I, I believe we have about five different types of procedures that you can uh, actually at any given point select for a patient like the sleep gastrectomy, the ruin Y gastric bypass, the adjustable gastric bypass, and, and other incredible procedures that you guys perform. Um, and always, oftentimes, as uh, Dr. Rivas pointed out earlier, uh, we do get either leaks or uh, fails in the actual procedures that they, they were performed. Um, do you see a change in the outcomes of these procedures secondary to the new technology, or is it more of a technique utilized by the actual surgeon, the bariatric surgeon? that is performing these surgeries? So to be honest, bariatric is, is so much controlled in the United States. Um, even though uh, we kind of talk about these leaks and everything, uh, the percentage of a leak happening here is less than 1%. And to be honest, it's very low. Um, to study them is, is, is really a, 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 a challenge for us. So even though we are kind of talking about all these leaks and stuff into you know multidisciplinary thing, it's 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 a it's a kind of a a, a um, very rare thing because as you said we have learned a lot. We we'll, initially you you learn about operation, then you learn about physiology of it, you learn about physics of it, you know because we have made changes to the technique depending on what we have learned in our own patients. To be honest, mm -hmm. so you progress you learn and 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 you always kind of understand why you know having a complication is kind of not a nice thing for a surgeon we kind of yeah. beat through it you all know it um yeah. we kind of go dig deep and then kind of is it me is it not me is it like so that has helped to be honest that anxiety helps and I always talk to our colleagues or my mentors or my seniors and say what could i have done better so we have learned a lot, so it has helped. And also with that has grown this technology. See, like probably 10, 15 years ago, there was no robotic, but now right. I have robots. So this has given me more precision, more visualization, more stuff. And are we doing more complicated patients on them? Definitely we are doing more complicated patients mm -hmm. and we still keep the complications of like leak and stuff low. So that's what the advantage of all this stuff is. You want to do it less. Yeah, and, and sometimes the actual results uh, speak volumes, obviously, especially on morbidly obese individuals that are diabetics. Uh, you, the, the bariatric surgeon, always say, uh, diabetes has basically been cured on my last staple on this particular patient because the ultimate outcome. So that is absolutely a phenomenal achievement uh, in, in the role of practice in surgery, but more even so for uh, diabetes, it's actually a win. Uh, in, in, in your opinion, what would be the type of surgery that you favor the most or that you think that you should recommend the most? Like the sleep gastrectomy has been like the wow factor nowadays. Everybody wants to sleep. And, and instead of the uh, ruin uh, Y gastrectomy from the past. So what is your opinion on that? So there are a few factors to consider. I always give the choice to the patient. Listen, there is a big patient factor in bariatrics, to be honest. So it's just not surgeon. This is also a multidisciplinary kind of involving the patient because patients need to participate. Patient needs to follow diet, exercise. Just because we do surgery doesn't mean that's the end of it. 
they have to change. There's a big change that they do. They, those people who have done it, they've done really well. So there are a few factors. So depending on what your BMI is, I mean, yes, your BMI is high to do bariatric, but in that also it ranges, as I said, mm -hmm. it's varied from 35 to, we have done 70, 75, which is very high BMIs, you know, rare, but we do them. So depending on your BMI, you are a high BMI, you probably need something a little big like a gastric bypass. Mm -hmm. And if you are a diabetic, you know, you want to get rid of your, your diabetes fast, that's a gastric bypass. And even sleeve works great. I'm, I'm a, I'm, I will do it. But the patients need to understand. They make the choice, right? So, and uh, the other thing is what your eating habit is. So let me get some water. <laughs> so it all depends on your eating habit too. Because if you are a big portion, sweet tooth, if you are a sweet tooth, <laughs> to prevent you from eating sweets, I have to do bypass. So those are the things that you consider. And also patients come and say, hey, my aunt had bypass. She had a lot of problems. I don't want it. It's okay. It's okay. So we sit down as a consultation in my office. We talk about it. So that way they, we both come to a consensus about what is right for the patient. So this is individualized. This is for the patient. This I do it for them. And they have to commit to it. People have done well. You're talking about diabetes. Let me tell you, one of my patients um, has submitted uh, 10,000 feet without her, um, you know, CPAP machine. So that's a success, you know, in itself. In itself. Yep. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Ramos. So uh, one last question, doctor. Uh, so much that we've learned, is there anything new as far as anything we should be doing on the follow-up side as to follow-up <coughs> scopes? with certain frequency or that has not found to be at all, or maybe five years out, 10 years out, is there anything we should be, uh, that you all see that uh, you are recommending post a, a procedure later on like as a checkup? For a bariatric, they're supposed to follow with us for five years, you know, with me. So I usually bring them initially frequently and then for the next five years, I bring them regularly so that way I keep an eye. This is all about, I know watching them closely and giving them the tool to take care of themselves. Most of them have done well because with the stomach that I take out, I send it to pathology. If there is anything going on, we take care of it like H. pylori or something. I take care of it right away. So patients do well. Um, and then I'm very strict with them and tell them that they cannot use NSAID or smoking post bariatric surgery. So that way, those are the patients who get into trouble with the gastritis, ulcers and stuff. So if you have those and they start doing all that stuff, then they need a endoscopic evaluation. But for most part, they do well without any of this stuff. They, they've done well. Well, thank you so much, doctor. Uh, this has been an amazing talk. And uh, maybe later on, we can have another conversation of more bariatric on the next, uh, next time we, you have time available for us. Sure. On behalf of Baptist Health International, I like, would like to thank Dr. Rupa Siddharamaya for her informative presentation and all of today's participants for your attendance. If you have any additional questions about today's presentations, please feel free to email them to us at bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. That is bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. We will get those questions over to Dr. Sita Namaya and she will tell us any way to answer or anything else. You can also reach out to us at the phone number that is provided. We look forward to seeing you at our next general surgery lecture series scheduled for Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023. Thank you again. Have a great afternoon. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Enjoy your time with your family and friends. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you.